My guest today has left an indelible mark on our lives through his endeavors in sports, business, and philanthropy. His journey from Southern California through Oklahoma and back to Southern Cal culminated in a Hall of Fame career with the Dallas Cowboys, and his likeness is now immortalized in bronze, no less, at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Troy, forgive me for you know being a little giddy, but I've been looking forward to our time together here uh, for some time. Yeah, welcome to Great Day. Yeah, welcome to Great Day Nation, brother. I love it. Thanks for having me, Mort. It's a pleasure. I know we've had it. Uh, we've had it scheduled for quite a while. Yeah, and I appreciate it. And I know you've just finished uh, a busy season of broadcasting, and that's not where it started, man. It, it, it started in SoCal, and 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 then went to Oklahoma of all places, and. The guys I've talked to, Troy, over the years, there's a couple of themes that, that, that occur. You know, they're defining moments in our lives. Uh, some come from very rough neighborhoods, some of the guys, and they find their way out of that through, through sports, through determination. And, and for me, when I look at your timeline, when I look at your life, you know, you're in Oklahoma, you start as a freshman. And we might as well start there because I think one of the defining moments, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the defining moments in your life really came your sophomore year when when you go down with an ankle injury and then you see a quarterback step in and win the national championship yeah. for the Sooners, and, and then it's kind of gut check time for you. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, you know, that was against Jimmy Johnson in the Miami Hurricane, and uh, Jimmy had recruited me to Oklahoma State. Uh, coming out of high school, he was the head coach there at the time. I decided to go to OU and then uh, <clears throat> was playing. I, you know, I was told when I was coming out of high school there at Henrietta that that Barry Switzer was saying that they were going to stay in the I formation. Marcus Dupree was there at the time, and uh, they were telling some other people they were going to go back to the wishbone. And so the class that I came in with in 1984, part of us, Keith Jackson was a part of that recruiting classes, the number one tight end in the country. Everybody always asks why I went to Oklahoma with it being a running school, but Keith Jackson went as well. And so they had half the class was kind of thinking they were going to be this pro style passing attack. The other half the class was kind of told they were going to run the football and, and ultimately that's what they did. But my sophomore year, when I was the starter, I was running the wishbone. So even though I was playing, I wasn't, I wasn't really enjoying the football side of it because I knew I was in an offense that, that wasn't really tailor fit for me. And, but when I broke my leg and then Jamal Holloway came in and, and led the team, the national championship, he was big, uh, big eight back then is what it was offensive player of the year. I, I knew that for me to play, I was going to have to transfer. And that's, uh, that's when I made the, the tough decision to transfer and went out to UCLA and then things kind of got back on track for my career. How big a help was, I know this is going to sound weird, but Barry Switzer actually was kind of helpful in that process. Yeah, he was. He was. To, to UCLA. Yeah, I went into his office to, I, I told him in the spring, I, we were told that it was going to be an open competition for the quarterback job, but I mean, come on. I mean, the, 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 Jamal had just taken him to the national title. So I knew that there was no chance that I was going to have any opportunity to be the starter of the following season. But I went into Barry's office and, and said, Hey, I, I think I'm going to transfer. I think it's best for me. I think it's best for everybody. And, and Barry knew that. And so he was really helpful. He, he reached out to a, a number of schools, wanted to know who I was interested in. UCLA was of course, one of those. He called Terry Donahue personally and along with a lot of other head coaches. And I, I think deep down, I think Barry kind of felt bad that it didn't work out. Uh, I don't think he was misleading to me. I, I don't think they really knew what they were going to do when I was being recruited. Uh, and so it was, I think it was a bit of a relief for him as well. So I, I kind of feel like you were a pioneer of sorts because back then there wasn't a lot of transferring going on. Right. I mean, and now we see it all over the place. So, you know, we, we know what, you know, you just told us what inspired you to make that decision. Yeah. Right. But, but, in hindsight, does, do you wish you'd stayed with the Sooners? Or it, it turned out to be pretty good. Well, it, yeah, it was it was good. You know, I loved going to school there, and uh, I now with when you look at Oklahoma now and you see all these Heisman Trophy winners and they're running the offense that that I wish that I had been running when I was yeah, no when doubt. I was there. So people, the younger generation of kids, they don't 
they don't remember <clears throat> Barry Switzer and the wishbone offense and, and all of those things. So, yeah, it would have been nice had it have worked out. But uh, my time at UCLA was, was really special. And uh, Terry Donahue, I, I still hold him in the highest regard. I, 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 don't, I don't know of anyone that I think of more than, than him. Uh, so I learned a lot, uh, certainly kind of paved the way for my development in uh, getting ready to play in the NFL for sure. You transferred to UCLA, and I want to touch on some of these guys recently that, that have transferred. You got, I mean, Heisman guys, Joe Burrow, Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts, Justin Fields. Uh, these are all Heisman runner-ups, Heisman winners, Heisman finalists. Why are we seeing so much of this? And Is this good for college football? The fact that they're transferring? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, you know, I don't know more, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, I don't follow the college game all that closely. I know that we, we see a lot of these guys move from team to team. And as you mentioned, back when I did it, you know, very few had done it. I, I know even that year, Barry Switzer talked to the team and he said that – when players transfer, usually that's the last you ever hear of them. And so I always remembered him saying that when I was transferring to UCLA, but now you do see a lot of it. Um, I, I, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's good or bad or, or not. Uh, but I've sure enjoyed watching these young players that have gone on and, and had success. And uh, you know, the year that Joe Burrow had a couple years ago at LSU and, uh, but it does seem like there's a lot more flexibility for these quarterbacks and other players to transfer and get to play right away as opposed to what it once was. UCLA today is is obviously a different machine than when you played. You had great success for two years there. Yeah, I mean you you were you were all everything, you know. And you guys played in, in bowl games and and winning records. Uh, when you look at today's UCLA team. Uh, Chip Kelly, 10 and 21 right now in three seasons at UCLA. Uh, that don't remind me, Mort. Sorry. <laughs> Is he going to turn this thing around? Or what, what do the Bruins need to to do? they start over fresh or keep going? Uh, going no, I think we stay the course right now. I, You know, this past year obviously was challenging for a lot of reasons, and I don't know how much we can really look at that and try to figure out whether it was good or not, but – I think Chip's an outstanding coach. Uh, he's got his guys there now. Uh, and we'll see. I think this next 2021, we'll get a better idea as to exactly where we're at. I know that, you know, Chip had an opportunity to go to a lot of different universities and be their coach. And, and we were able to land them. And and it had been a while since UCLA had really been able to, to do that. But you know, when I was there, like you said, we were a really good football team. We won 10 games both years that I was a starter. We were number one there in the country for about three weeks my senior year. Uh, and we had a lot of really talented players. A lot of guys went on and played in the NFL. And I know there's some restrictions in being able to recruit some of the student athletes, getting them into the university academically. But all of those things, I think, are excuses because I know firsthand the type of players that we had and how good we were. And I just uh, I'm really hopeful that we can kind of get back on track and put together a program that we can all be proud of. After UCLA, man, it became all about how about them Cowboys. <laughs> um, it sure did. It sure did. And and started quite a quite a trip for you, uh, along with uh, the other two guys that became part of the triplets. Of course, Michael Irvin was already there, and Emmett Smith was soon to join. And you're you're the first pick there uh, in the draft in uh, let me see 19 what 89. 89. And uh, you know it doesn't start great. I'm with the Saints by the way in 1989. Your first start as a pro ball player yeah. was against us, and I think we kind of blanketed you. I'm, it's the only thing. Mark, it's the only thing I could find, man. Yeah. Troy, it's the only thing I could find on you, bro. You were, that, that... You were kicking a lot of extra points and, and a lot of kickoffs that day. I remember that. So, yeah. <laughs> so, again, you know, when you, when we look at the Cowboys in the 90s and the dominance that was to come, <clears throat> it's interesting. Again, here comes the theme, you know, start from nothing and build something. And, you know, you add you add your your talents 
and skill set to Michael Irvin's skill set and a lot of other great players, obviously. And then you get Emmett to run the rock and you go from 0 and 11, which, you know, Michael has said many times he was crying after each game yeah. because he hated losing. He wasn't used to losing yeah. at the U. And you weren't used to losing yeah. at UCLA. Right. How difficult – take me through those early years <clears throat> and, and what was the shift, whether it was mentally, emotionally, because I know you're a nonsense guy, Troy. I've heard it enough, uh, spent enough time with you that you, you like to keep it real, and if you see something you don't like, you're going to say it. Yeah. I've always felt like you were one of these guys that walked the walk, you know, Thank which I appreciate about Thank you, really do. Authentic, real – tough and if i can't do it i'm not going to criticize it kind of thing yeah that's a true leader where did the shift come was it was it a combination of things was it the head coach the change there you know t- take me through those early years yeah. and how that thing evolved yeah it was uh it was rough i mean it was really tough my 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 rookie year as you said i was 0 and 11 as a starter we were 1 and 15 as a football team we were the worst team in the league when when I was drafted, we ended my rookie year as the worst team in football, and and I never experienced winning uh, that entire first season. And and there were games, there were games where I didn't play well at all, and we gave gave the team no chance to win. And then there were other games where I played about as well as I could possibly play, and and we were in a position to win, only to lose at the very end. And I and I just remember Mort walking off the field so many times, thinking man, what do you have to do to win in this league? And, uh, and it, it, as hard as it was, it, it really helped me in the later years appreciate how hard it is to win and never lose sight of that. And so it really helped me throughout the remainder of my career. But my second season then you know, when you when you join a team as the quarterback and they already are the worst team in football, it's hard to feel responsibility. It's hard to take ownership for how bad you are as a rookie. And I found myself in that category kind of saying, yeah, we're not any good, but hell, this team wasn't any good last year either, you know. And, <laughs> you know, but then you go into year two and then I, that's when I felt real pressure. That's when I felt like, well, now – now, if we don't win, I'm really part of the problem. I'm now I'm as much a part of the problem as anyone else that's here. And fortunately for me, our first game in 1990 was against the Chargers at home, and we won the game. So, so I immediately got at least my first win under my belt. But, but my second season more was even tougher than my first year because we were three and seven at one point. And I just remember it was the low point of my career. And then I don't know why it happened, but we went out to Los Angeles to play the, the Rams. They were in Anaheim. We played the Rams. They were a really good football team at the time. We're three and seven. We're not playing very good. But we found a way to win that day. We beat them. And it really propelled us. We then won four in a row. We got to seven and seven. I, I dislocated my shoulder, needed surgery in the 15th game of the season against the Eagles. But we were on the doorstep of making the playoffs. If Had we have won one of our last two games, we would have made the playoffs. And then that season ended. We finished 7-9, and nine, went into the offseason, 1991. Norv Turner comes in as our offensive coordinator. And we went from being the worst offense in football to the ninth offense in football in one season under Norv Turner. And it totally turned our program around. And we went 11-5, and five, went to the playoffs, beat the Bears in the postseason, lost in the divisional round to the Lions. And then the year after that, we won our first Super Bowl. So, so that 91 season really kind of gave us the confidence that we could be a pretty good team. And, and, you know, so what propelled us, I think it was that four-game win streak in 1990, but also when we traded Herschel my rookie year. I love Herschel. There was not a bigger fan of Herschel Walker's than mine than myself, but we had a lot of picks. And then most importantly with those picks, Jimmy drafted a lot of really good players and, and Emmett Smith was one of those picks. And, and so we, we became a team that was really not very talented to arguably the most talented team in football in a short period of time. And so whenever I talk about Jimmy, as great as he was as a coach, 
he was probably even better as 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 a talent evaluator. And and so we uh, we got really good. We worked our asses off. Uh, we, we approached things much like you would in college. We did things that the veteran players said, hey, you can't do that in this at this level. But we did it and uh, we hit a lot. Our practices were physical and we were young enough to kind of get through all those things and, and still be fresh and able to play on Sundays. But all of that collectively is why we were able to turn it around as quickly as we did. Yeah, you win three Super Bowls and you probably could have won five. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Is that your, is that your feeling maybe? Yeah. I, I, there was more uh, there. Uh, you know, I'm asked a lot how many I think we could have won had Jimmy have stayed and, and, and more, you know, as well as I do, it, it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to put a season together and win it. Um, yeah, but, yes, it is. but so I don't want to say, oh, we would have won X number more. I, what I do know though, is we would have been competitive a lot longer than we were. We, we would have been really good and at least had a chance to get to the postseason and win a Super Bowl for a long period of time. And I think, you know, the biggest disappointment to me in all of that, Mort, is we were constantly told, you know, when the Pro Bowl votes come out and there's always players who are upset that they didn't get voted in. And it's always kind of a tough time for those guys that had great years that didn't get voted in. And it's a tough, it's a tough thing to handle as a coach. And so Jimmy would always talk to the team and he'd say, look, you know, I know there's some guys disappointed about not making the Pro Bowl, but if we have the success that we hope to have as a team, there's going to be enough credit to go around for everybody. Everybody's going to have a hand in our team success. And we all did that. More, myself, Michael Irvin, Emmett Smith, all of us sacrificed to some degree in order for our team to be successful. And we did it very happily because we, we wanted to win. But the two leaders of our franchise, the owner, Jerry Jones, and then Jimmy Johnson, they couldn't make that work because they both wanted all the credit. And so that disappointment for me was that egos are what ultimately tore our team apart uh, at a time when the players themselves were sacrificing so much. And that's uh, that's the most disappointing part of it all for me. That's very interesting. You kind of, you know, and I, I do want to touch on Jerry, obviously, because he was the owner. He was signing the checks and uh, – Fills out a room, no question. Yeah. So did Jimmy. And I think to your point, uh, reconciling that and finding a strike and a balance there maybe was part of the downfall, f- downfall uh, or, or the reason that you didn't win more. Is that what I'm hearing you say? The 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 breakup between those two? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, we had a good thing going. The early years were tough. They were really tough with Jimmy. And uh, – but once we got it going and then we kind of learned, or me especially, some of those guys had a history with him. Guys like Michael, had, of course, had played for him in college. But, you know, we we, we, we knew what was expected. Uh, we loved playing for him. We were, we were really good, having a lot of fun. And, man, our second Super Bowl when we beat Buffalo in Atlanta, to think that that would be the last game that Jimmy Johnson would coach us, I mean, we, it's, it's unimaginable to – to be back-to-back champions and then go back to your third year and not have, not have your head coach, uh, you know, be the guy leading the troops. And so um, I, I do think that I think it happened so early for Jerry in his ownership and so early for Jimmy and him being a head coach at the NFL level. I don't know that either of them really appreciated exactly what we had. I think if, if that had happened later in, in, in their time, they would have found a way to, to make it work because a number of coaches that were on that staff, they've, they've gone elsewhere. They've coached a long time in the NFL. When I see those guys, they still point back to those years in the early 90s and say, you know, those teams, you can coach in this league a long time and never capture what we had. And I think everybody would probably do things a little bit differently if they could. Troy, with uh, with time and with experience comes perspective, comes wisdom, and comes reflection. Yeah. And that, I think you're spot on right there. Had they know now what they knew, didn't know back then, yeah. could have been different. Absolutely. Hey, I want to talk to you just a little bit about leadership. Uh, you mentioned the four games starting with the Rams where you kind of felt like that was a turning po- point for the team. And it became, I don't want to say it became your team because it sounds like it was 
leadership by committee a little bit. But at what point did you feel like, and what was your style of communication, if you will? I think I know the answer, but I want to hear from you. Um, how did you guys hold each other accountable? You, you've already mentioned you guys sacrificed a lot. And I would imagine that also accountability has a huge place in there. What was your style? And how did you uh, how did you kind of lead the troops? Because let's face it. The court, you always look to the quarterback for leadership. Yeah, and just by the nature of the position, you know, teams yeah. do, and 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 that's not always. Uh, it, it 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 doesn't always mean that the quarterback's a good leader, but but I but you're right that people do look to the quarterback, and you know, for me, I, I think you said earlier, and you're right that that I was pretty much a no nonsense guy, and and uh, I was demanding. I mean, I was very demanding of the team, and. My teammates expected a lot, uh, didn't expect us to waste any reps in practice and was pretty vocal about that. And, you know, the good thing for me, Mort, was when when we had Jimmy as our head coach, you know, he was that way. Jimmy, as I said, was tough. And so it was kind of the good cop, bad cop scenario to where Jimmy would call the team up at practice. He'd be upset about the way things were going. I would totally agree with everything he was saying. And he'd let everyone have it. He'd start the practice over. And then I'd be the guy who would come into the huddle and say, guys, look, let's hey, forget about him. Let's just let's just go do our thing, you know. <laughs> but I agreed with everything he said. So I, I could kind of be the good cop. And then when Jimmy left, we didn't have that anymore. We, we, we really didn't have the hammer. And that wasn't, that wasn't Barry's style. And so I then had to take on more. I had to take on more of a vocal uh, leadership role. And it was it was challenging. I mean, it was tough, and and it's hard to be, it's hard to be that guy all the time. And uh, it took a lot of the enjoyment uh, out of the game for me. I know, um, but I just really felt that I felt my job more was to do whatever was necessary to give our team a chance to win. And you know, others if others were playing quarterback for those teams, they would have done it their way. I did it my way, and my way was was being uh, pretty much a hard ass and being tough on guys and demanding. And you know, I, I think that if I were playing today, I'd probably approach it a little bit differently. You know, I think I'm, I'm I think I'm different now than I was back then. But you know, I don't apologize for for the approach. It, it served us well, but uh, but it wasn't it wasn't as much fun as it had been when Jimmy was coaching. Yeah, and so Jerry and Jimmy, they break up the band, and it's very clear the band's not getting back together. And yeah. here comes Barry Switzer, and it had to be a little bit surreal for you. I mean, you have Barry in, at Oklahoma, and here comes Barry Switzer yeah. uh, on his on his horse all the way from Oklahoma, man, and here we go, boys, and, and hey, Troy. Uh, surreal, awkward, what's the word? I'm, what, put, put words to it. Yeah, it was uh, because the whole breakup with with Jimmy and and Jerry was at the owners' meetings, and Jerry said, uh, you know, one of five hundred coaches could have done what he had done, and th at that time he mentioned something about I'll just go hire Barry Switzer, and and I remember thinking Barry Switzer, and he, where does he fit into all this, you know? And he hadn't even been coaching for a number of years uh, after he re retired from OU, and. Sure enough, I mean uh, that's that's who we went with, and I thought it was a great hire. I mean, I really did. That uh, the Barry Switzer that I played for at Oklahoma was tough. He was demanding. I thought the players would love him, would love his style, and uh, you know Barry's Barry's got a terrific resume. I mean, he's been a great football coach for a long time. We got him at a little bit of a different time in his life uh, from when I played for him there at Oklahoma, but uh, yeah, it was. It was pretty much Groundhog's Day for me, Mort, because even after Barry Switzer left, before we hired Chan Gailey, they had uh, there was talk that Terry Donahue was going to then follow Switzer, and so I'm thinking, man, it, we just keep. Going. That's good. You know, we, you know, my high school coach is going to be coaching this team before it's all <laughs> over with, but uh, it didn't work out with Donahue. But yeah, it was. Uh, it's quite a story with all those all those guys who just kind of keep circling back through in my life. Well, it does happen around the NFL anyway that a lot of guys get regurgitated and recycled, let's face it, players and coaches. Yeah. You have a ton of concussions. You have back injuries, and it forces you 
uh, at what point do you say, okay, enough is enough? I mean, was it literally physically, it's too risky to continue at this point? The, uh, the concussions um, that I had, you know, a lot of people talk to the, about the concussions. The, the, the back was the biggest uh, issue for me. And um, ultimately why I, if it was, if health had anything to do with my retirement, it, it would have been because of my back, certainly not minimizing uh, head injury. But I even thought at the time, Mort, that whether the number was seven or eight or whatever the number of concussions was that I had, I felt that relative to a lot of other players, I thought that I'd gotten out pretty light, really. Everyone, everyone always pointed to me and Steve Young. But now they, they've proven that these repetitive subconcussive hits by the offensive linemen, defensive linemen, uh, you couldn't tell me that I had more head trauma than – you know, some like Daryl Johnston, who was our lead fullback blocking for Emmett Smith, he's banging with his head every single play. Now he's yeah. he's doing fine, thankfully. I saw him just yesterday, but uh, but yeah. So I thought I got out from that pretty well. And at, at 54 years old right now, um, I don't have any anything that concerns me. Uh, but and the back even has gotten better. So I'm I'm uh, I'm in good shape, and I feel that relative to a lot of other former players. You know, you see these guys like I do. I don't. I don't know how you feel physically, but I feel really good, and I feel like I got out of it uh, pretty much unscathed. Yeah, you know, I rolled for th- twenty-five years. The plant, the plant leg took a little bit of a beating. You know, twenty-five hundred forty-four points is a lot of swings with that leg. But I would say overall, I I, I feel pretty good too. It, it's it. You know, it tell it helps to lose some weight. There's no question. Yeah, I mean, I was that's too, right. And I was too heavy for a while. I'm just getting lighter now, and it, it's alleviating a ton of problems. So, yeah, yeah I appreciate you asking, but, uh, no, I am feeling better. You make a very smooth transition to the broadcasting booth with Joe Buck, and uh, you become the number one team with Joe, really, in your second year. You did a little bit in NFL Europe mm-hmm. and practiced, I think, just kind of uh, wet the beak over there and get used to it, and then you go right in. Yeah. And what, what, what is fascinating – I know you – thought about coming back there was a chance with the san diego chargers and they took doug flutie and then miami dolphins and how serious were you there and and were you ready to really just say all right let's go with this broadcast i was uh i was serious about going to the chargers uh north turner was the offensive coordinator there at the time uh mike riley was the uh head coach and thought that that's where i was going to go and and then i got a call and you're right they said that they had signed doug flutie Instead, so that made my decision to retire pretty easy. Uh, when I had considered coming out of retirement and playing for the Dolphins, North Turner was the offensive coordinator there for the Dolphins at that time as well. He, he was the common denominator in all of those things. And Dave Wanstead was the head coach. Uh, they thought they were a quarterback away, and I was all set to do it. I, was, I started training that offseason, prepared to come back and play. I'd been in retirement about two years, I believe, at the time. And uh, uh, Rick Spillman was the general manager at the Dolphins. And ultimately, it was Rick who didn't pull the trigger. He just had his reservations. And as it turned out, I'm, I'm glad he didn't pull the trigger because the Dolphins did not have a very good football team that year. They were not just a quarterback away. They had more holes than they thought. I think they went 6-10 and 10 that season. And so it was kind of a blessing in disguise. And then after that opportunity uh, didn't happen, there was never another consideration for me. I mean, I was I was 34 when I retired. And, uh, you know, now at 34, guys have, you know, they have eight, 10 years left. You know, so it's a a different different time. But uh, yeah, the broadcasting has been the broadcasting has been awesome. I I really thought that I would do it for, I don't know, two or three years till I figured out exactly what I wanted to do. And I just finished my 20th season and I've been working with Joe for 19 and it's been, it's been great. It's really, it's, it's as good a job as there is. I mean, I I feel like I've got the greatest job in America. Uh, It's, it's a grind doing these Thursday, Sunday games like we've done the last three years, but to get as much time off as we do in the off season and to be home, work from home during the week, even during the season, Raising my girls, my youngest now is a senior in high school, so they're you know they'll all be out of the house. Um, I've been really blessed and fortunate to have this career. It demands of you to go in the booth as an ex-player and be objective, and it, I would imagine in the beginning it was more difficult than it is now after twenty years. 
as you're a little bit further removed from the the personal relationships, the players, the coaches are new. So there's not that impetus for being fair. Yeah. But it's so important to be objective. I always felt you were. Thank you. I always felt you were uncompromising in that way. And I think sometimes that's misunderstood and misinterpreted uh, on the part of critics. Um, so I want to say that out front. But um, if you don't mind just spending a couple of minutes on today's Dallas Cowboys. I know it's a sore subject probably, but uh, I mean, what are we going to give him a, a letter grade? It can't be a big one. It can't be a very good one for Mike McCarthy after his first season. But what kind of grade? And and and, and I got a couple other follow-up questions. Well, it was uh, obviously a tough year for them. Um, more, I really – I haven't drank the Kool-Aid, but I don't think they're that far off from being competitive. I think that – you know, defensively, they had some issues. I think they have some holes that they need to address in free agency and in the draft. But uh, on the offensive side of the ball, I'm, I'm, I'm confident they'll get a deal done with Dak. I thought that a year ago, but I do think that they will. They've got some outstanding skill players. Uh, they had a number of injuries up front on their offensive line. I, I think that any team with the injuries that the Cowboys had are going to have some problems. I think once they're healthy – they should be uh, really competitive uh, is, is, is what I see. Um, I, I do, like you said, Mike McCarthy comes in. He's first year as a head coach. They struggle. There's a lot of pressure on him now going into year two to, to, to not only have a decent year, but to have a great year. And, uh, you know, how does this team respond to all that? Hopefully they have a normal off season and can kind of, Put things together. I know there's other coaches around the league that were in their first year and had success. Uh, didn't work out that way for Dallas, but I do think that I do think they should be pretty good in 2021. Do they make the playoffs in 2021? And have we seen the best of Zeke Elliott? Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I do think the East, as bad as the East was this year, I think that it's a division that is going to improve dramatically. Uh, and it's going to get back to the competitive division that that we've kind of known the NFC to be, the NFC East to be over the years. I I like uh, what Ron Rivera is building in Washington. Uh, I think Joe Judge has certainly earned the respect of the players and the organization there in New York. I think they'll be they'll be much improved. Uh, Philadelphia, it's hard to say right now. There's a lot of turnover that's happening there. And with their quarterback situation, what's that going to look like? But I do think the East is going to be more competitive. And uh, you're going to have to have a winning record, I think, in order to win this division next year. <laughs> so who, who's better off now, the Rams or Detroit, with the trade, the, the big trade we saw, golf to Detroit, Stafford to the Rams? Who wins yeah. that? Well, I think it was a trade. I, I mean, I think if you're the Rams, you're probably a little disappointed that that you felt that you had your franchise quarterback. You gave up a lot to get him when you got him out of Cal. And then you, you've given up a lot of picks in order to get his replacement. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's a tough position for them to be in. But as far as this trade in and of itself, I think both teams – probably look at it and feel pretty good about it. I think the Lions feel good with what they received in compensation. And I feel that the Rams are excited about Matthew Stafford and what he'll be able to do for that offense. So, you know, we'll see. I think for Detroit, it now, it's, it goes back to what we were talking about with Jimmy. It's one thing to have the picks, but what do you do with them? And if, and if they make good picks, then maybe this will be the trade that really kind of helps get them over the hump and get them playing competitively more consistently. And what about my New Orleans Saints? Drew Brees looks like he's probably going to hang yeah. him up and, and go to the booth and be one of your colleagues there. Yeah. At least that's what it looks like. Um, are we going to have to draft a quarterback? I don't think we can go with, with Jameis Winston or the Storm and Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> I think we uh, – I haven't heard that, but I don't think I can use that one on the air. And today, <laughs> you know – well, this is a pod, man. We can. Yeah, you can. And and you're Mort Anderson. I mean, you can say whatever you want. So. Well, I don't know about <laughs> that now. <laughs> I don't know, though, Mort. Uh, you know, in talking with Sean, Sean Payton, he's kind of uh, – he's implied that the future is in the building, and that's Taysom Hill. So, 
Wow. I'm I'm as interested as anyone. I, you know what I think would have been interesting? Had Drew Brees have retired a year ago, uh, they were after Tom Brady. And and I think that Brady probably signs with New Orleans uh, oh. if that had been the case. And, you know, it, I mean, this was a hell of a year, as we know. I mean, he's playing in the Super Bowl, for crying out loud. But that would have been interesting to see what that looked like, too, had he have gone to New Orleans. My guess is, is that, you know, maybe New Orleans might have been Playing in the post or in the uh, in the Super Bowl, had he have done that as well, as good as he is, but uh, I I don't know. I think that I, it it seems to me that that uh, Taysom Hill is going to have every opportunity to kind of be the guy wow. at least early you, on. You're, you're shocking me, and I hadn't heard the Brady angle. Uh, that that's what you get when you're up there, man, in, in, at the network. Yeah. <laughs> My take was that if Matt Ryan didn't have a forty-seven and a half million dollar cap number of dead dead cap. That that could have been an interesting play for the Saints to to go after Matt Ryan. Yeah, I I think I think Sean is so good. Sean Payton is so good that you know for him to be doing it as long as he's been doing it and putting together these offenses, and yet he's still on the cutting edge along with some of these younger coordinators and and head coaches. That uh, any quarterback that gets a chance to go play for Sean Payton is going to have every opportunity to be really successful. And you know it it it, it makes me want to say then Mort that. There's so many of these quarterbacks over the years that have just gotten into tough situations, you know, where they just uh, weren't given much of an opportunity. And if you're one of those quarterbacks like myself who gets to work with a North Turner or a Sean Payton or a Kyle Shanahan or a Mike Shanahan and a Bill Walsh, I mean, you go through the list of guys over the years who really understand offensive football. If you're one of those quarterbacks who get an opportunity to work with those those coaches, Boy, what a what a what a blessing it is because a lot of guys have come through this league that haven't had that type of uh, support, and it's uh, it's the the game's hard enough. Um, but it, yeah, I think a lot of guys have left our game with the label that they weren't very good, and I think it's more that they just didn't get put in the right position. Yeah, I don't think I I don't think Mahomes is too upset that Andy Reid is sitting there calling plays wow. for him. No, he's uh. He's done. I don't think Andy's too upset that Patrick Mahomes is throwing the football <laughs> for him either. <laughs> hey, just to put a bow on this conversation, it's been great uh, to have you on, Troy. Uh, I usually end with a, with the name game, so I'm just going to throw a name at you, and whatever comes to mind, all right, you throw back at me. Okay, Emmett Smith, uh, uh, superstar. Yeah, Irvin, Michael Irvin, the playmaker. Uh, special friend. Jimmy Johnson. Uh, you know, the word content kind of comes to mind when it comes to Jimmy. I, uh, I admire him for that. He knew at a relatively young age, uh, around my age right now, what was going to make him happy. And that was being in the keys, uh, on the ocean. And, and, and he went and pursued it. He could have made a lot more money had he have stayed in football. Uh, but yeah, I, I think of I think contentment when I think of Jimmy. Jerry Jones. Uh, complicated, you know. Um, a great. Seller. You want to? Yeah, he's want to explain that. Well, he's yeah, he's a he's a he's an unbelievable salesman. I mean, he's a when 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 the history of our league has talked about Jerry's going to have, you know, as prominent a role in 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 telling that story as anyone who's ever been a part of our league. You, know, you think of the stability that the league has financially and with these TV networks. And really, Jerry Jones is pretty much solely responsible for that. And, uh, and, and, and yet, you know, him wanting to be the general manager and do everything his way, you know, he's taken a lot of criticism for doing it that way in Dallas. So I, I think, he's a, I think he's, a real, he's a force. I mean, he's a real force. And he's a really complicated individual, but he's done a lot uh, for the betterment of our sport. Barry Switzer. Um, I, I, I think of uh, uh, a guy who nobody knows how to have more fun than Barry Switzer. I, you know, there, Barry Switzer, I've always said, will never die of a heart attack. I mean, that guy, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's much stress in his life. Uh, North, North Turner. Um, Wow. Uh, Norv is a, a, a great friend, a mentor. He's like, he's the big brother I never had. And uh, we're still extremely close. Um, I still look at, look at him as a, as a big brother. 
And, uh, you know, there's a reason why he was my presenter to go into the Hall of Fame. And, and without him, uh, you know, my career wouldn't have been what it was. And, uh, and I don't think we would have won at the level that we won without him. Charles Haley. Uh, total character. Love him. I love him. I absolutely love him. Me too. And uh, he's a special, special. He kind of falls into that same category as, as Michael Irvin. That uh, I have I have a friendship with both those guys. That's that's really unique um, and unlike any other friendship that I have. I love those guys to death. Uh, would would lay on railroad tracks for both of them. And uh, I'm really proud of Charles and all that he's been through and where he's at right now. Deion Sanders. Um, prime time. He's, uh, you know what? I he's another one. He's a he's a great salesman. Uh, one of the most optimistic people that 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 I've been around. He has a, a confidence in himself that that's unparalleled. And I think that him taking that Jackson State football job, um, to me, just validates everything that he's been about and, and what he's been doing, working with the youth and coaching football. That uh, It's one thing when you're coaching your son at the high school level. It's another thing when you become the head coach at a university and you're really putting your whole reputation on the line. Uh, and he's doing that. I'm real proud of him for doing it. Joe Buck. Uh, Joe, the, the most talented guy in our industry. Um, he's a, he's a dear friend. We're, we're, we've been, Joe and I shared a lot of, uh, a lot of life experiences in our personal lives, uh, seemingly at the same time. And, uh, we both have two daughters. Uh, his are a couple years older than mine. Uh, we both went through divorces around the same time. Uh, we've been best of friends for, for 19 years. And, uh, and then on a professional level, there's just nobody more talented than him. He's, uh, he's really fun to work with each week. Finally, Morton Anderson. Uh, my man. Morton is my man. <laughs> You're the greatest, okay. Morton. I mean that. I mean, really the greatest. Uh, I'm, I'm, it was, uh, I, that, that's too self-serving. <laughs> yeah, but I've told you before. I mean, your, uh, your speech at the Hall of Fame, I, I, it's still my favorite speech. And uh, I just remember sitting there that day watching you give it and thinking, man, this guy is he, he's 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 saying all the things that it's not a surprise why you were as great as you were. And I thought your message was awesome and your story was great. And uh, yeah, it's an honor. I appreciate to be on this podcast with you. I appreciate you having me. Troy, I, I appreciate you and, uh, you know, your message and your life has been an inspiration to me personally and to millions of people out there thanks for entertaining us th continuously and still on fox man uh, a lot thank of fun you, and uh godspeed brother love you man love you bud thanks mort appreciate you see you bud